Hey, welcome to Lords of the Fallen, and dear lord do I keep fallen. For the sake of not bitching for more than half the video, I'll exclude the mini-boss turn to standard enemy bunch, with the exception of those I liked. As well as a couple of the NPC type fights, like what do I even say about Andreas? He's okay? I guess? But as much of a mixed experience as I've had in Lords of the Fallen, I enjoyed its roster of actual bosses which I'm going to be ranking from awful to amazing, and all that usual stuff. Beginning from the awful tier, which I haven't had to use in a while. Oh dear. So Adir is an imprisoned god whom you've been tasked with destroying for good in the name of the Holy Oreos. These guys really love cookies. So with such an impressive stage being set, how is the actual fight? Well, it's literally Deacons of the Deep. Except, much worse. And Adir isn't really the boss, he's the background. The real boss is this guy. These scrawny ass dudes who feel like generic mobs you cut down in droves in every single level of this game. You hunt down the marked ones to damage Adir's health, and as the fight progresses, they get more and more aggressive. Eventually, it just turns into an average day at Kalrath. The enemies are designed to drag out the fight as much as humanly possible by limiting your access to them with those damn fire circles. The only difficulty is when enemies hurl fireballs at you from off screen, or when your patience runs out. And believe me, it will. Especially because all that time you have to listen to this cunt blabbering about, Oh, woe is me, I don't like Oreos. All I wanted was to destroy everything. Cry me a river, bitch. Now maybe for some, this is a cool story moment. Me personally, I'm not here for that. But this kind of lore fights have been done much better. Think of Maiden Estrella, for example. This fight is just annoying. It doesn't convey anything. It's awful unless you enjoy law being vomited on you. As a whole, my biggest issue with Lords of the Fallen is enemy variety, enemy design, and enemy placement. As far as I'm concerned, the game is great, but those bring it down so, so much. And when I get to a main boss of a long, tedious level, what I want is anything but more standard enemies. And that's the Hollow Crow. I honestly feel the game developers just don't know how to create challenge other than by overwhelming the player with ludicrous amounts of enemies at once. And even then, it's not really hard. In my three playthroughs, I think I only died once or twice of this boss in total. I know people that feel like it's their duty to defend these underdog souls likes as to resort to saying, skill issue, the game is different and you just suck at it. Like, no, it's neither unique nor challenging, it's just shit. It's fine if you like these fights. But it would be cool if people didn't just assume I suck at the game and that's why I'm complaining. I like hard fights, those are usually my favorites. Once again, they hype up the boss with a cool as shit design, only for it to be background while you kill the usual trash mobs for the entire fight. Your goal this time is to damage the humming ghost lady, who will vanish and summon an ice storm every time you hit her. And every time you deplete her of health, the crow will summon icicle barrages at you for a little while, as a sort of phase transitioner. That's why I think the hollow crow is a step up from a deer. At the very least, the actual boss has some input in the battle, other than non-stop talking. Thanks to the exclusion of such hits as Griefbound Rowena, Carrion Knight whatever the fuck, Vitress of Hounds, Insufferable Enchantress, and so on, we're making fast way into the positive tiers. But before that, we have to tackle the Iron Wayfarer the protagonist of the previous attempt at Lords of the Fallen. That alone is cool, I love the concept of killing myself. I like the model too, he kinda looks like a corrupted Thor or Slave Knight Gale's emo brother. And he has a Witcher 3 soundtrack playing for some reason. Sadly, they decided to cram him into a room so tight, you'd choke Tuco. Oh, tight, tight, tight. Seriously, I think it's stupid how little space there is when the entire point of the moveset is outspacing massive AoEs that leave lingering magic mines hovering in the air. It's like they realize they don't know how to make it difficult, so they just cramp the boss into a space where you would have no room to dodge anything. Maybe to some that limited space is the appeal, but to me that greatly hurts what's otherwise an alright little mini-boss with lots of story behind it. I said I would exclude some of the NPC type fights, but I made an exception for Rapturous Huntress. The reason she stands out is because her style of fighting differs greatly from the usual boring, mace-wielding knights you fight the entire game. She lives up to her name and feels like a huntress, trapping you in magically created fences to limit your space, and then losing your line of sight on her before closing in with rapid spear thrusts. Losing lock-on is a little annoying, but it fits her theme. 
She also admittedly kicked the shit out of my ass. I didn't die or anything, but I had to work for my victory. And I can appreciate that when it's done without the need of swarms of enemies. The room you fight her in is badass looking too, I love the atmosphere around here. Now that I've made it pretty damn clear I hate the ganks in this game, it might come across as a surprise I wouldn't have the trio gank boss on the lower tiers of this list. Especially because I do hate these Nazgul Shadows of Yharnam Grim Reaper assholes whenever they appear in the game's levels. But when it comes to just fighting them and not worrying about other randomly spawning enemies, it's actually pretty fun. They alternate between being aggressive and disappearing into mere shadows on the ground to ambush you, and it lets you have a sort of a breather every once in a while. And because of that, it's very rare for them to just pile up on you at the same time. And man, I just love parrying these dudes. It's so god dang satisfying. So, not a great fight or anything, but I do get a kick out of it. Even if I'm not entirely sure if I should. Spurned Progeny is this game's obligatory giant gimmick fight, but surprisingly, it relies rather little on any gimmick. You begin with your typical angle biter phase 1, where you can't see the entire body of the boss when up close. Which kinda sucks. I do like the giant shockwave he can send out from his fist slam that winds up spreading across the entire room. Many bosses have this kind of moves to be fair, but it wasn't overused at this point in the game, and it fits especially well in this fight because you don't need to see the entire body of the boss to dodge it, just the ground. After some pedicure, the progeny will puke up lava to force you to the platform surrounding the area. Then we get a fight resembling old Iron King of Dark Souls 2. Only, not a shit. You don't get to hit the boss as you please, and instead you have to wait until he does an attack that leaves a part of his body on the platform. It's boring when dragged out, which is why this was unimaginably tedious on New Game Plus. New Game Plus in general sucks, but this was the point I realized how bad the scaling was going to get. Thankfully, on New Game I think the health is just low enough that you shouldn't find yourself getting too bored. At the very least, you can admire the absurdity of a fat Jack Skellington having an arm come out of his mouth to either throw fireballs, nuclear explosions, or just to slap you around. So overall, it's a fine boss. You know, one of the most controversial takes I've had in recent times has been my distaste for Archbishop Andreas from Lies of P. I felt the presentation of the boss was unimpressive, the design looked kinda dumb, moveset felt rigid, and so on. And it made me wonder, why do I enjoy the Congregator of Flesh a lot more than that fight? Because in essence, this is the same deal. It's got very basic moves, not a whole lot of mobility other than jumping up and down, but I think the presentation of it is just day and night in my eyes. Like the way it's animated and designed, it's all jiggly and gooey looking. And there's the wonderful use of a grotesque hole of blood that is this arena, with mold and corpses everywhere. For a gross out boss, this does everything right for me. One very small detail I appreciate is that the camera is zoomed out and sort of off-center in a way it isn't for any other boss, which makes it feel a little more nightmarish, I guess. Love the way the environment is actually a part of the fight too. When it stomps, corpses from the ceiling will rain down screaming, and he can unleash a tidal wave of blood and decay, as well as use the blood as lubricant to slide at you. So it's a cool fight, but having done it on New Game Plus with much higher stats, it exposed the fact that there really isn't much to latch onto gameplay-wise. It's a little boring. Runers are absolutely way too complex and attention demanding to be just standard enemies scattered around levels. You hear that, Bramus Castle, you fuck? But for that complexity, Runer does make for a pretty good mini-boss. It's hard to tell when his axe combos end, and I like how he can seemingly, at any point in the combo, end it on a delayed slam that sends out a wall of fire at you. My only issue is when he leaves a little totem thingy on the ground which will shield him and create small explosions if you get close to it. And in order to stop it from protecting the boss, you gotta destroy it. And because it has quite a bit of health, I feel it's a bad fit for this fight. The boss itself is so attention and focus demanding that having a separate target you have to not only hit a bunch, but also dodge whenever it ignites itself, is a bit much. That and the Runer's subsequent appearances end up ruining the Runer a little bit. Our final decent tier fight is Sundered Monarch. And boy am I happy I didn't do this fight on New Game Plus. I would still be on it as I speak. Not because I'd keep dying, but because that's how much health he would have. It would last that long. Even on New Game it feels astronomical. And for a boss that's not a whole lot more complex than slow slams and swipes, it does overstay its welcome a little for me. But what's good about his moveset is that his attacks require unusually precise dodge timings, or smart directional rolls. 
Those slams send out massive shockwaves and you have to adjust your timing to the distance of where the epicenter of the shockwave is. Or just dodge right into the epicenter. And with those slow swipes you should hold off on pressing dodge until you see the source on his arm glow. That's a nice way of indicating the timing. And speaking of those glowing swords he has, I like the use of his model being a part of the moveset. He rips out blades stuck on his back and throws them, and in later phases it's raining swords all over the place. And I guess I should mention that it's a very story-driven fight. Not really into the lore personally, but if you are, he's definitely a big, tragic player in it. And even my ice cold heart felt a little bad slaying him when he began crawling back to his deceased wife's statue. So here we have the elder brother slave knight Artorias, Blade of Mikela. Probably the most Souls-inspired boss I've ever seen. But it's like that kid who copies someone else's homework. They got the things that are supposed to be there right, but something's missing. Most of the things they got right are more present in Phase 1. It's a typical well-functioning night duel, but exploding arrows, sword projectiles, and good music go a long way to making it feel cool. And the fact that the bolts explode with a delay means you also have positioning to worry about, and that's always a positive for me. There's also the annoying kid trying to interfere with spells and shit, and they make for a decent enough addition without being a distraction. You can definitely see the Twin Princess inspiration here with both of the cutscenes. Oh dear. Another dogged contender. Another unfortunate made a slave to unceasing hunger. It's so uncanny you can't deny it. Unfortunately, Phase 2 is no Twin Princess. It's a stupid looking model of a tiny child's torso sticking through the neck of a big hunched knight monster. It doesn't look scary, it just looks comical. And while there are some neat attacks in Phase 2, such as the spinny nail that goes out and back in, I feel it lacks any kind of rhythm or movement. The boss isn't aggressive, it just kinda stands there, sometimes jumps back, does singular slow moves, then suddenly explodes with no warning. I think this half of the boss drags down the enjoyment a lot for me. So a great intro phase is unfortunately left just a little disappointing without a proper follow-through. For being nameless mobs who only serve as obstacles defending a chest, I am shocked at how good of a duo boss this is. There are, in my mind, three ways to make a good gank fight. One, you have one be slow and the other fast. Two, you have them do synchronized moves instead of having completely independent AIs. Three, one tends to stay back and do ranged abilities while the other is more aggressive. The abiding defenders fall into the last category. Whilst dodging the simple strikes of one defender, you constantly have these golden swords moving in a crisscross pattern. It's something you have to keep your mind on, but not to the point where dealing with a second target is too chaotic. And as an incentive to not just target one of them, they will resurrect one another if not killed around the same time. Seen it done a billion times in duo fights, but that's because it works. I might even prefer that over just sharing the health bar, because now you'll have to alternate between the two instead of just the Sister Frida and Father Ariandel effect, where everyone goes for the Big Daddy, because that's the easier target. Really nothing negative to say, even if I wish it was more impactful and meaningful than just the throwaway miniboss. The Knight ripped straight out of Blasphemous is by far my favorite miniboss, or Sinner as they're called in this game. I mean, this has to be a reference, right? They both even have thorns on their helmet and sword. Such a shame he ends up being recycled in later areas like many of the other mini-bosses, but not to the point where I didn't enjoy this fight on repeat playthroughs. Whereas the Runer, as good as it was, I don't want to see him ever again. This one is just a classic knight versus knight duel with a fun moveset that's aided by his ability to clone himself and do combo mix-ups. And the music, even if it is played for many of the other mini-bosses, I really like. If there was anything at all that could take away from the enjoyment, it's his ability to add a healing buff onto himself. Thankfully, it can be removed by destroying the Umbral Parasites, and once you're aware of that, it's just a very brief distraction. It's just pure fun. Light Reaper follows the trend of a first boss you're supposed to lose to, which is beginning to lose any impact, but they also turn him into your nemesis throughout the entire game. And that's I like more. You're more than likely intended to lose the first two times, but the third is doable and fourth is final and your progress is halted until you finish him. Now what I really like is that third encounter. On New Game Plus or a fresh second playthrough, you can absolutely beat him here and get good rewards earlier. And of course the intended effect here is that you keep seeing yourself getting better and better at the fight. His dragonfly by move first seemed scary and tough to dodge, but by the third time I was on autopilot dodging it. Which leads to my biggest complaint about Light Reaper. That intro lasts too long. 
and I don't like how he just repeats it after taking a very small amount of damage. And while he's on the dragon, he's invulnerable and lasts for almost 40 seconds before you can get back to the fight. After a while, it gets tiresome. If you could either herd him during it, dismount him, or if the move had some unpredictability, it would go a long way to making it more worth going through each time. As it is, it stands in the way of a fun, agile boss fight. Since many of his attacks involve multiple rapid hits, it's not enough to just iframe through it all. You also have to plan ahead in which direction you're going to dodge in order to come out of invincibility in a safe spot. He has zero combo mix-ups, but I think the emphasis on positioning makes up for it somewhat. Like the move where he drags his sword across the ground and releases a little trail of lava. Or his spin dance followed up by a quick dash that also leaves a lava trail in the final phase which you can take advantage of by dodging backwards into the spot where his dash will land him at, so you can punish the move. That's the stuff I like to see. But while it is neat to have the dragon return to action whilst the Light Reaper is dismounted, I think they could have gone a lot harder with that. In general, it feels like the fight lacks climax. He does have a final phase with more fire, but it didn't go crazy enough for me to consider it truly amazing. I was kinda left with a feeling of, that's it? It's very rare for me to come across a boss that feels like it's something different, and something I haven't seen too much of before. And Hushed Saint is a pretty unique fight. He begins the fight on horseback, but it's not like Lu Bu or Kyobu or your typical horseback bosses. Instead of staying in the battlefield, he's diving in and out of water, and your goal is to dismount him when he's charging at you. You can either play it completely safe and just wait for him to dismount himself, which is probably a bit boring, or you can try finding Umbral Parasites to pop in his face. Or you can try to parry his melee strikes if you don't feel like dealing with that umbral shit. It's not like incredible or anything, but I appreciate the different flavor this boss has. He's like a headless horseman of the swamp who's been infused with its vines. It's cool! His phase 2 is most of the fight though, and it is a little bit basic. But there's one thing that keeps it interesting the whole way through. And that's how he can submerge in the water and then jump out and ambush you with three different abilities. A delay slam, quick spin, or summoning the horse. The slam and the spin require very different dodge timings, so it certainly keeps you on your toes. I also felt his combo mix-ups and odd timings made him one of the very few actually challenging bosses in the game. And it was nice to get my ass kicked by something other than fucking archers and dogs. Pieta is an effortlessly well-made first boss that really took me by surprise. Well, besides the cutscenes, I think they could have put a bit more effort into that one FPS blood. I had seen a lot of footage of this boss prior to the game launching, and I thought it looked a little boring. But there is a surprising amount of depth here. Combo mix-ups, chief among them. But having them in a starter boss could obviously result in frustration to new players, which is why I think the animations and attack speed of this boss is brilliant. The moves are extremely readable. You don't need to learn the timing on them by trial and error to know how to handle them. You just look at the animation and dodge when it feels right, and that's usually the correct timing. She also has a well-made two-phase structure, where some moves in phase 1 will come back into play in more intensity in phase 2, so even though her base attacks are completely different, you're not wasting time doing her first form if you're struggling at her second. Could do with more cloning action though, and I'm not talking about the times when she does a fly-by move with them. There's not a whole lot to that move other than that it looks cool and limits your space a little bit, but thankfully there does exist a fight that answers that need perfectly. So the first question I and many others had upon learning there's a quote-unquote true final boss was, is it worth it though? The answer is no. It would have to be the best boss ever made to be worth doing another playthrough with a quest line so stupidly complicated it feels like you're studying rocket science. Your life goal can either be going to the moon or getting the umbral ending in Lords of the Fallen. That being said, if it's your first playthrough and you have an umbral ending guide in front of you, go for it because it's a great boss. It's a remix of Pieta, but with a dumb-looking Xenomorph head. And with a fun duo twist. Once more, Lords of the Fallen shocks me with how it can actually make good gank fights. While you fight Alienus clone, you have slow-moving eyeball barrages harassing you. And I think the reason they work fine is because they only do wither damage. So you can get your health back, and it's not the end of the world if you get hit by them. Otherwise, I think it would be a bit too much. But my favorite thing in a gank fight is a synchronized move. And that's what this boss has. That's always very nice to see. If you kill the clone in time, you'll stagger Elian, get a repost and a bullet hell face transition. This is an awesome move. 
My issue, however, is the repetition. This is essentially the entire fight right here. Kill the clone, eyeball tornado, kill the clone, eyeball tornado, kill the clone, eyeball tornado. And I just get a little tired by the end. She does gain a couple moves throughout, but not enough to make it feel like it's hit that climax. Eliane's moveset is great, but you don't see that much of it because you're mostly fighting her clone, which has a slightly more limited moveset. Tancred looks absolutely badass, but he felt overly familiar to me. And this was before I even realized he's a straight up reskin of Hushed Saint. It's just more Holy Light AoEs and a pole arm. I had just done the Cleric Judge, and I felt like I was doing the same fight. It's fun, but not for its own merits. In the end, I forgive it as it leads to Reinhold the Immured, which is a fantastic bestial type enemy. It feels like a good Bloodborne boss. He even has breakable limbs like many Bloodborne fights did. However, instead of the broken limbs altering his moveset, it just stuns him and lets you evaporate his health. But what I love is how well he adjusts to your positioning. If he does a head slam and you stay in front of him, he'll do a longer combo. But if you dodge right into him and end up either under or behind him, he will immediately respond to it by either repositioning himself, doing a kick, or jumping up. Same goes for his claw swipes. And if he does the kick and you dodge toward him and end up right in front of his face, he can also immediately continue with another attack. So I like that adaptiveness of this boss. Phase 2 adds big lava pools that if you're in the center of, a simple quick step won't be enough. You have to roll to get out of there. So it's not only a great body horror boss that's painful to look at and to listen to with its contorting limbs and exposed guts, but it plays superbly as well. So get out of here, Tancred! Reinhold is absolutely carrying this fight. Once more at the number one spot, I am massively struggling to decide if this is a top great tier fight or a bottom amazing fight. It's riding right in the middle of those two tiers, but I can definitely say it's not the best boss ever made or anything. It's really great, but there is a little bit of room for improvement, especially in the sound design department. Whenever I get to phase two, it plays both phase one and phase two soundtracks on top of each other for a little bit. All while the explosion sound effects and such feel super muted to the point I can't really even hear them. What I love about her though is how even though her base moveset is very simple, she adds complexity with different kinds of lingering AoEs. In phase 1, she's like a battlefield commander, summoning volleys all around her. So sure, there's not much to think when she does her generic 3-hit combos, but when in the context of a volley nightmare where you need to watch your step, it's a little more complicated than that. That being said, I don't really enjoy the move where a massive circle of arrows keeps following you. It just keeps you off the boss until it's over. That's not fun. But her phase 2 flips things around by having the same core moveset, but with fire instead of holy magic. But along with that, she's replaced the arrows with exploding crystals and I imagine many probably find them annoying to deal with. But I think they're perhaps the best part of the fight. They force you to keep moving, but you can still get hits in on the boss because the explosions are so tiny. It accomplishes the same effect as the arrows, but without turning it into a running simulator. Now, you could destroy the staff that summons the explosions, but it's not really worth it with how much health the staff has. But that's fine, because I don't really want to remove that ability anyway. It's the one thing that makes this fight really intense towards the end. And what's more, she has just really cool looking abilities. I like the staff thrust that turns into a fiery beam, the move where she flies up in the air and slams down, sending out fireballs in every direction, as well as doing a surprise reverse on their usual shockwave explosion where it actually comes back and you have to dodge it twice. But ultimately this fight clicks for me for a very simple and stupid reason. If you have a boss where there's epic music playing and the boss is flying around with explosions everywhere, chances are I will probably enjoy it. That's one of my favorite things to experience in a video game, regardless of which game it is, or how well made the actual moveset is. Luckily, the moveset is pretty great too. And that's it for Lords of the Fallen. At least, for now. Probably forever. Until they make a third game in 10 years and call it Lords of the Fallen again but I want to give some of my closing thoughts on the game as a whole. I think if this game had the enemy variety of Lies of P and much better thought out enemy placements, 
it would be an insanely good game. I like the level and world design, it just sucks that the game boils down to having the same exact enemy encounter in every level. It's always like this. There's a pack of dogs and an archer or two in the back. It doesn't matter if you have an ice archer, a fire archer, or a poison archer. Or if you have armored dogs, normal dogs, fire breathing dogs, or ice dogs. It's the same fucking thing! It's bad enough that you don't have a good variety of enemies, but when you use the variety you do have to just create the same enemy encounter in every room, Jesus Christ does it begin to feel tedious. You could probably tell from the ranking itself that I appreciate difficulty, but I don't like it when it's bullshit. And I think this game is a lot of the times unironically bullshit. It's straight up unfair, and that's not a challenge that feels fun to overcome. That being said, the dev team has been updating this game a lot since launch, and my hope is that maybe some months down the line the game will be in a better state. If not, at least I got some fun bosses out of this game, as well as the chance to make this video, which I'm thankful you watched, and I hope you enjoyed it. Alright, that's all. See ya.